Um, we're going to start with um, a bit of an insight. I saw a stat the other day that 57% of Americans haven't read a book in the last year. And that really shocked me. But I think I had an insight that, in some ways, that's a possible superpower that you can kind of just take off the shelf. And what I mean by that is the stuff that you can get in books that you just can't get anywhere else. Um, and I kind of wanted to put that forward and sort of say, like, do you, do you agree with that? Um, I, I, I do. Um, and we have to also include in that e-books and audiobooks, not just yeah. print. Cause do we include audiobooks? Yeah, I do. Um, is it the same? Yeah, look, it's, to, to me, uh, in our field, usually a visual field, um, we, t we tend to look for books with pictures, uh, and that's cool. But um, my, my dad, um, he, was, he was the uh, youngest editor in the country in Ireland, age 24, uh, of a regional newspaper. Mm. Um, at the time, I had no interest in writing or news. Now I do. Um, but he, he said to me, for most of my, my youth, and when my son was born, the same thing, he said that a book is the most powerful book, uh, gift you can give somebody because we have to make up the pictures. It just yep. sparks your um, imagination. You have to fill in the blanks. And I include in that audio because we go back to uh, you know, the First Nations of this land and, and others, an oral tradition of telling stories. And, and Jane O, oh, um, she, she <laughs> told a great uh, sort of uh, series of case studies of, of the importance of storytelling. Yeah. And I think whether it's oral, whether it's written, if, if it gives us the ability to fill in the blanks, mm. It, it, it gives us uh, a harder workout, mm. but it gives us a lot more to work with, I think is the way I would look at it. That's amazing. Yeah. Now, we're here to talk about this book that's sitting right here, and there is a lot of pictures up, and can you just explain what we're seeing on the screen? Yeah, uh, a, a couple of weeks ago, I was very, very privileged to launch this book in, in semi-permanence um, in, in Sydney, and uh, I have to say that this book was designed by Mark Gowing, who's a, a legend. He um, and his partner Sandy published it under former editions. So, so when they invited me to launch the book, I said, Mark, you've got to be on stage with me because it's our book. Your design, my content facilitation, and together it's us. Um, and um, I think to, to sort of... Um, to be able to be in a position, I'm not going to ask you a question, I think, I'm going off on a tangent. To be in a position to bring uh, the words and wisdom of the people who are on, on, on screen here and, and others is incredibly humbling. I mean, mm. I say it's my content, my book to a degree, but I just ask questions and people answer them and the people that answer them are way out of my sphere, um, way beyond who I ever thought I could have the privilege to talk to. Uh, and they are in the design field, many of whom you will know, um, I'm sure, and outside the design field. And what I was really looking for was a, a way to access how they see and navigate the world. Mm. And for me, that was probably the impetus to, to get those people. So back to semi-permanent, why this is here is that it was going to be an interview. It was an interview in semi-permanent as well. And Mark and I said, well, what are we going to have in the background? There's a big screen. Um, and we thought the best way to tell the story of this book is who's in it. And, and, and that's why we have such yeah. amazing mm -hmm. people. Now, it's an anthology. Yeah. And I guess we should go back to what Open Manifesto was. And for me and a lot of my peers, it was incredibly powerful. And it was a perfect time for where design needed to be discussed in a much deeper way. But for anyone who is sitting in the audience who doesn't know, is, who collected Open Manifesto like I did? Yes. There's quite a few out there. Is there? I can't see any. <laughs> <laughs> so I can tell him anything. Yeah, everyone put their hands up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, for anyone who didn't yep. collect it and, and live by it like I did, 
Can you explain it quickly about w what it was and where it came from? Yeah, look, uh, very quickly, and, and if anyone knows the story, I apologise, you'll be bored of this, but um, I, I, I was a uh, joint creative director of Sachi Design um, in Sydney, part of the Sachi and Sachi group uh, between 2000 and 2007. But in, in 2003, we had a, an exhibition of, of, our, of our best work mm. in, in the agency. We had an exhibition to sort of celebrate the work as a new business sort of pitch uh, or, or a new business uh, exercise and to teach the agency colleagues what design was and why it was valuable. And we just won a DNA a yellow pencil. So an international award, amazing. And, and I was like, fuck, this is incredible. I was 29 and I was like, wow. And I was incredibly worried. <laughs> I thought, is this it? Like, we, we get work, we win an award, we, you know, we do our best, we get work, we do our best, we win an award. And I thought, I've arrived. <laughs> Fuck, what am I going to do now? Um, I've got to get out. I have to get out of this field because it's either going to be downhill or a plateau. Yeah. Because it's going to be the same. But I didn't know what career I would choose. And I thought it would be too hard work, so maybe I'm lazy. Um, but I, I, I thought, well, rather than... Rather than change careers, is there a way for me to move to the heart of it and, and question it? Mm. I want to really figure out what the hell what we do means in the world, not just you know get a brief, do work. Um, and I'd had an idea in my head for eight years that I was too scared to do. I didn't think I was qualified to do. I didn't think I was in a position to do. And it was a, a publication. Mm -hmm. And it was at that moment that I thought, I've got this really big thing in my head that I want to explore, and it was the first slide, design's intersection with social, cultural, political, and economic issues, which doesn't sound sexy at all, then and poss possibly now. Um, but that for me was, was the, uh, the lifeline that I needed to not have a, a treadmill ahead of me, not change careers, and actually just question what I am doing and how we operate in the world. So that's not a brief answer, but that's the answer. Right. Yeah. yeah. And it's obviously something that was very important to you personally. Yeah. Did you expect it to um, create such a buzz in Australia and even worldwide when you were publishing it? Yeah, I knew at the very beginning, at the very, very start, this was going to be the best thing in the world, and it was going to be read <laughs> everywhere. Very good. And, and, uh, it was just about convincing everyone else. I was. It was like, come with me, everyone. No. I, I, I had no idea what I was doing. I, I, uh, Jane you know, said she wasn't a writer. I, I wasn't a writer. I wasn't a journalist. My dad was an editor. I, I'm not an editor or a writer. Ne never, never thought I would be. Um, I, it, it took me eight years to convince myself to give it a go, not with confidence, and I had no plan as to what it might be or how long it would last for. Mm. I did have two kind of um, touch points. One was the theme, social, cultural, political, yeah. economic issues, and the other was to expand it beyond just designers talking to designers about design. I had no idea that people in Australia would read it. I didn't think anyone in Sydney would read it. Um, so to have it at this stage, to have it with those people in it, mm. it was never, even during the 15 years of it, it was mm. never something that I, I, I could understand. Yeah. It was never something that when I would meet people, I, I was interviewing Wally Olans in Kuala Lumpur, and he was at a conference, and we met in the foyer of the hotel before he went to the conference, and this other gentleman came in, and very friendly guy, and, and um, he was Irish, so I thought, Kindred, yes. <laughs> and he's like, hi, you know, I'm, I'm Paul. I said, oh, I'm Kevin. And he went, Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, Irish dude, Wally Ollins. And Paul goes, Kevin, Kevin Finn. I went, yeah. Open manifesto. I went, fuck me, what? <laughs> like, yeah, 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 yeah. So you do open manifesto. Are you here to talk about it? No, I'm here to talk to uh, Wally. <laughs> How do you know about this? So, and he lived in Amsterdam, <laughs> you know? Yeah. So, um, I had no idea it had any reach, yeah. and I'm honest with you today, I still am amazed that people know about it, honestly. It's, it was never the plan. The plan was to learn, explore, and, and, and question. So, mm. that's kind of a, that's a good answer. answer. <laughs> I have lo long answers. Yeah, it's great. We like long answers. 
Um, so you touched on it a little bit. Um, how did the overall collection come about? The overall? How did the overall collection come about? Oh, the collection. Well, it was weird. I was in um, semi-permanent again. Sorry, Matt. Um, I was a semi-permanent in, in Auckland. Um, and I was there to interview Michael Beirut from Pentagram. Um, and we actually didn't end up um, interviewing it there, but we were having dinner one night, and he said to me, have you ever thought about doing a, like a best of old manifesto? And I went, you're Michael Beirut, and you're saying this, really? Wow, um, I hadn't really thought about that, no. And I probably won't do it, but thanks. Um, <laughs> And then I interviewed him later, and, and it was great, and he was in part, issue eight, and then that became the last issue. I didn't know it at the time, but that, that was the last issue. Fast forward a few years, and I'm, I'm on the phone with uh, Mark Gowing, who I've known for years, and we're just chatting, and he, mid-sentence, was like, actually, have you ever thought about doing a, a, like a Best of Open Manifesto? And I went, now it makes sense, because Mark is Australian. He's based, he's, he's a designer, mm. um, and he's got a publishing company, it fits, yeah. and I, I thought, and he's independent, and I thought, I think if anyone's going to do it, it has to be, it has to be Mark. Can I, can I challenge that? Because yep. you're a great designer in your own right. Mark is a great designer. Yes. That sounds like a problem. Two, <laughs> two great designers kind of like arguing over like, I think it should have this on the cover, yep. or I think. How, yep. how did you work out that collaboration? We're not speaking anymore. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, uh, when, when, when he talked about it, I, I said right up front, I said, I, I, ha I have a rule that we need to employ for this book. Um, you're designing it and I'm not. I'm not gonna get in, into, I think it should be this, why not do that? Um, and I think when you're really- are you, are you happy with it now though? Maybe, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, th th I am, because what, what, then what Mark had said to me was, we need to look at the, the, the legacy of Open Manifesto as we're seeing it from 2022. Mm. And that was, that was the shift. And I'd said to him, I cannot do this objectively. I can't, I can't design it. I can't, I can't just put it together on my own. I, I need that collaboration. Yep. And the best way to collaborate is to trust who you're working with. Um, and we had an open dialogue. We, we had said, again, up front, we are friends first. There is nothing that can happen that we cannot talk about and get over. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. Yeah. And we only had one little sort of thing where we had to have a, I'm not sure about this kind of conversation, and it was mm. to do with the content, but we got past it. And he didn't sleep for three nights until he got to talk to me. I was actually traveling to Ireland, and it was, I couldn't answer the phone. I was on the plane. He thought I was ignoring him. He was freaking out. I said, no, 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 we're good. He said, oh, thank God. Um, so I just said, it can't be for me. Mm. Um, it has to be an objective look and design. Can I bring, you just said something before about um, bringing it into 2022. Yep. And I noticed there was an acknowledgement at the start of the book, which kind of explains that you, it's, it's as it was, yep. but there were certain things that you felt you needed to update. Can I ask what, what that was? Yeah, it's very, very specific, and it's good that you raised that, because, um, and, and Jane actually said it, we, you have, to, you have to remember that Open Manifesto happened from 2003 to 2018. Mm. Uh, so that's 15 years of, of a lot of conversations and a lot of shifting in society and, and everything. And Mark and his partner Sandy uh, and our, uh, co uh, our copy editor Naomi, they were having a chat one afternoon, <laughs> very close to the deadline, and they said there's a few pieces in what we have here that refer to First Nations culture in a way right. that has moved on. And the way Jane described it is not every story is ours to tell. So we, Mark particularly and Sandy, wanted to update how the content previously needs to be reframed. Today, it was small things, but enough to make it a reframe. Yep. And I said, I'm cool with that, except we gotta ask the contributors, their permission, yep. that they're okay with how we're reframing it. And there was only four of them, and they went, absolutely, done. So that was something that, you know, anyone, I don't know if anyone would notice when that shift happened, but it was our way of saying, as Jane beautifully put it, not every story is ours to tell. Um, we, had to, we had to just rectify that. 
And um, at the start of your book, you're dedicate, dedicating it to the reader. Um, what's your thinking there? When I did the first issue, um, I knew who I was doing it for. Why it was for me, but who was for was anyone who's going to read it. And it wasn't going to be a thing if there was no one who's going to read it. So I dedicated the first page, the first issue, it says this book is dedicated to you. And that has been consistent on all eight issues. Um, there's a beautiful little story where uh, I didn't tell my parents that I was doing this thing. Um, and then I came home one it was, I think it was Christmas and I had the first issue wrapped up and I gave it to my mum and, and she opened it up and she went, oh my gosh. And she opened the, the cover and, and she went, oh, you've dedicated it to me. And I went, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And everybody else. <laughs> Uh, but but I, 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 back then, I, I, I really wanted to acknowledge that this isn't, this isn't m just my journey. This yeah. is a shared, participatory journey, uh, and that was key to, to, to how I wanted to move forward. Such a wonderful sentiment. Um, we're going to stay with the book for um, a little bit more. Um, you split it up into four parts, mm. uh, open eyes, open channels, open arms, and open-ended. Mm -hmm. um, why did you choose those? It was actually um, Mark's partner, Sandy. She, she said that uh, we needed some, well, actually, Mark said we needed some kind of uh, sections. He and I were talking about every issue of Manifest had a theme. And if we're putting a collection together, we can't have a theme for everything because they're so diverse. Mm -hmm. And to give you an idea, if anyone who isn't familiar with, with Open Manifest, so, You've got amazing designers, oh, Michael Beirut, Paula Shear. You said Milton Glaser staring. So, yeah, so Milton Glaser <laughs> and if Roz is here from, from yesterday, we should talk with her. I had the chance to not just interview him, but meet him once. Uh, and he is incredibly kind and generous. But there's also like a real life cyborg. There's a real life superhero. There is a ex-CIA operative. Uh, you know, it's very diverse. have got Edward de Bono in there. So we were looking at this collection going, how do you pin all that together? And it was Sandy who said, how about we have four themes mm. that loosely knit together the content under a, a general theme? Mm -hmm. And she said, it would be nice to riff off the open yeah. sort of side of Up Manifesto and then open it up to, to those themes. So that's what yeah, I Yeah, nice. So, I mean, I was doing, I was in publishing at the same time as you were doing this. And I was intimidated by the people I was talking to. But they were nowhere near like where you know, the kind of level of the people you were talking to. Do you, do you not get intimidated? I think they're more scared of me. No, <laughs> <laughs> no look, um, I'll tell you two very quick sort of stories. The first one was, uh, uh, the first person I ever interviewed was Vince Frost. Uh, I didn't know him at the time, and we're now, like, so close. He just sent me a text yesterday, he called me his brother. <laughs> that came from me, scared shitless, to go and talk to Vince. It was actually my wife who said, you should go, like, deadpan, wasn't scared of who Vince was, and said, you should go interview Vince back in 2003. I was like, I can't, it's Vince, right? He said, well, go do it. So I did. Um, the second person I ever interviewed was Stefan Sagmeister. I was like, oh, jeez. And it was at Billy Blue, and it was in between two talks that he'd done, one for industry and one for students. And in the middle, back behind one of the rooms, I, I interviewed him. And he, walked, he, was, he was lovely, and he walked out, and, and I was like left on the sofa going. <laughs> and Simon Pemberton, if anyone knows Simon, he, he was Billy Blue uh, head of school at the time. He walked in, and he saw me, and he's like, what's wrong? And I was like, I should not be doing this. I, I am not the person for this. He says, why? Because I don't know what I'm doing. I like, I, who am I to be interviewing Stefan Sagmeister? I mean, whoa. And he said, do it your way. That'll be enough. That made me, uh, along with my naivety and inexperience, which masked my understanding that I was overreaching <laughs> every mm. time, <laughs> that masked my, my kind of um, self-doubt. But my curiosity to learn from these people overrode that. Yep. And the, the other little thing I'll say to, to sort of bookend it is when I was getting ready to interview Noam Chomsky, if anyone know who Noam Chomsky is, he's just the giant in, in the field of political activism, philosophy, the works. He's, he's a major linguist. Um, he gets people from all over the world, New York Times, Washington Post, 
wanting to interview him, and there's this dude in Sydney on his own with this independent little publication going, can I interview you? Um, I would describe interviewing people like that as probably the best laxative you can, you can have. <laughs> um, and you just got to push through, you know? <laughs> You've also told me some stories. Was it Bob Gill? Bob that was, Gill. Oh, that was funny. Was it quite... Yeah. Can you tell that story quickly? Bob, Bob, was a, Bob Gill was the co-founder of Fletcher Forbes Gill, which is the forerunner of, pen, forerunner of Pentagram. And I, I got Bob out to Sydney when I was at Saatchi Design to do a series of talks in Sydney and Melbourne. And he was like a design hero of mine. And he arrived, he, he was like 73 at the time, and he was still active and he was still doing stuff. Um, but he's a cantankerous New Yorker. And I was like, oh, this is going to be tricky. And I was scared, really scared. We were doing the, the talks, and every talk we did, he was using me more frequently as the butt of his jokes. <laughs> and I was like, all right, maybe we're friends now. He's like, yeah, we're, at the, we're on that, that level. But he was still quite cantankerous and quite heavy. But I said, I, I got to interview him. He's here, and I was terrified. What am I going to do? So I, on the last day in Melbourne, we were, we were in a hotel. He was flying out the next day, and I said, fuck, just, just call his room and get it over with. So I dialed his room and I said, hi, Bob, Bob, yeah, Bob, I wasn't disturbing you. Um, are we going to do that interview? And he said, yeah, 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 yeah. Should, should we do it? Yeah, come to my room now. <sighs> right, so went up to the room, knock, knock, knock. He opened the door in a singlet and white fronts. <laughs> and I went, is it come in? And I was like, sure, yeah, 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 come on in. He's like, cool. He gets into bed and he said, I was just having a nap. And I was like, oh, man, I was, oh. <laughs> He said, so, let's do it. In bed? Yeah, yeah, So I sat at the end of his bed. He was in bed, in un undies and singlet, and we had some, uh, the way I describe it, it was the strangest, most natural thing in the world. Um, and, and, yeah, so it was, there was some experiences doing this. Yeah. So <clears throat> I'm going to jump forward a little bit yep. here. Um, I know, because we talk quite often, um, yep. that your, I guess your day-to-day -day is changing quite a lot, sort of thing. It's, it's, yeah, it's design is still there, your writing, but this, this kind of, this passion for passion projects, can I say that? Yep. Um, kind of really exists for you? Yeah, and, yeah. I and mean... I just wanted to kind of like, I guess, delve into that a little bit more, because this was a passion project that's now become something else. And yep. it, how can... Okay, let, let me throw it out to you. I'm having trouble with this question. So, is how many people are working on a passion project out there? Self-initiated project, side project. Wow, quite a few. All right. How many people are sitting on a passion project? Yep. <laughs> yep. Oh wow! <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to add that. How many people here are too scared to do their passion project? Ah. Okay, too many. Okay, cool. Um. Is your question about... I don't know, but that, that was yeah, the no, question. No, 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 no. Um, <laughs> but I think you get where I'm I going. I do, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, look, it took me eight years to convince myself I might have the permission to give myself the chance to do Open Manifesto. Eight years. The reason why passion projects are, are self-initiated projects, I don't call them side projects, and I'll explain why that in a minute, um, but the self-initiated projects, why they're really important to me is that um, I understood I was my own block. I, w I didn't give myself permission. Um, and there's two sides to this, the, those who are scared to do it. Um, there's two sides to this because the first thing you have to do is give yourself permission to do it. And the second thing you have to do is be okay with actually bringing it out in the world. All right? Because you can have a side project and sit on it for years and just hide and go, I don't, I don't need to be judged out there because no one knows. I know. It's me. And it could be for you. That's good. But over the years, I've learned that when you put anything in the world, not a, just a self-initiated project, but work, the amazing work we've seen, put anything out in the world, there's three, generally three kinds of people out there. People who are going to love it. Hard, hard to believe. I didn't believe it. There's people who are going to love it. Then there's people who are going to hate it like, and let you know. They're going to hate it. And the third kind of person is, is they're not going to give a shit. So if we look at that and we say, 
I've got a personal project, a side project, a self-initiative project, and I know there's three kinds of people. Well, I want to lean into the ones who are going to love it because that's healthy. And you need to know that whatever you're doing is bringing value to those people. They, they love it. They go, oh, wow, great. And you can be humble enough to go, thank you. The haters, we also ignore them. I, I kind of go, well, actually, you've managed to get a reaction out of those yep. people. So you're doing something with impact. Amazing. Lean into the ones who love it and the people who are on, you know, don't give a shit on the fence. Maybe you can convince them to, to come on board as well. But none of that should stop you. You should, you should do it for you because I learned so much from doing it. Yes. Have you... Sorry, I'm totally taking over this interview. But that's fine. We're like pretty much thinking the same yes. question, so it's fine. Uh, has your practice changed because of all those interviews, even putting this anthology together? Yeah, I, I mentioned it in, the, in my intro that, that um, one of the kind of upside downsides of doing Open Manifesto is upside, it, it, it really exposed me to a really big conversation. I mean, I never thought I'd be talking to Noam Chomsky or Edward de Bono or, or uh, Errol Morris, who's an Academy Award winning film director or, or an ex CIA agent, and like none of these people, but it opened my mind to what I call a bigger conversation. Um, and that was amazing and it was problematic because then I went back to my practice and what I realized was I'm having these really small, hyper focused conversations about a client's marketing needs. It's really small, it's really limiting. And over here, I'm having these big, big conversations. And that has forced me to have to change how I work. And I say have to because it's not a choice for me. I, I, I cannot work that way anymore. Uh, I has, still have projects like that, but it's difficult. Um, and I don't know if Mike Tassetto is here, but Mike and I have been having conversations uh, over the last couple of days. I don't refer to those sort of engagements as clients anymore. And I have a very specific reason why, because I think our field is in a really uh, immunitive space where we refer to clients and they see us as suppliers. And they have a very hyper-focused marketing need that we yep. need to fulfill. And we need to put all of our creativity and all of our ideas into that funnel to, to have that. So I don't refer to them as clients. Um, and I, I run a business, and I'm the worst business person in the world because I don't want clients anymore. I want, I want businesses that I work with. And it's language, and it's, you know, I guess probably quite a um, slight shift, but I refer to those engagements now as the businesses that I work with. And to go a bit further, I say it's the people who I work with who happen to be in a business that I'm working with. So I'm shifting it away because we need to be having, as a, as, a, as a field, we need to be having conversations with businesses and brands who are in a position to change the world because of who they are and what they do by default. We, I see we need to be doing more in that um, co-creation, challenger space, advisory role. And, and again, Jane was a really good example of how they're doing that with Nike to, to say, we need to challenge the businesses that we work with, and we need them to know that we're not the supplier, we're, we're not there to just fulfill, we're not servile. And, and, and that is a shift. And for me, it's come from this project, really, over 15 years, and language. So I can get the language right, yep. and I'm able to have those conversations. Um, and it has changed the conversations I'm having. We are running out of time, but just Sorry. quickly, I understand there's a, another book at the printing. Yeah, um, this took a year and a half to do. Uh, and in, in behind all that, um, I, I spent four years working on another book. Um, because I started this out, Open Manifesto, not as a writer, not as a journalist, not as a, anyone who thought I could do anything in this space. Um, it taught me how to write. It taught me how to think. It taught me how to interview people. It taught me how to see the world in a bigger, bigger space. And again, I needed to put that into something to articulate that. So I spent four years writing a, a, a book called 
brand principles, how to be a 21st century brand, and it's for business owners so that they can come to all of us better primed, have big conversations, and see their role in what they're doing. Uh, and I'll be controversial here and I apologize, but uh, I don't think majority of people in this room and in our field build brands or create brands. That is not our role. We are the assist. It is the businesses and the people in there who build it every day, day in, day out. And our language again is, oh, we build brands, we create brands, we do fucking branding, we do logos. You know, I think if we move towards having the bigger conversations, yes, yes maybe we can be in a position to build brands because we are advising and we are challenging and we are pushing where they need to be in the 21st century. Um, and all of that has come about um, from, from, from the back of this. And I'll just add that for the, the three of those years working on that, um, I didn't tell my wife. <laughs> so that was a surprise for her. <laughs> she knows now. <laughs> yeah, she knows now, yeah. So, yeah, so that's, that's kind of what's happening at the moment. So I guess for me, it's like, just to finish up, I know we're probably over time by flashing one minute. Um, the self-initiated projects can take you somewhere you didn't know. Uh, if, you, if you try it, if you take a risk, everyone up on stage here and in, in here as well, particularly up on stage, the one thing we all have in common is we've taken a risk. I call it a considered risk. And I think back yourself, give yourself permission. You don't know where this is going to take you. It will change how you see the world. And I think it'll help you see the value that you have to give um, as a gift. Um, and who knows? If, 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 you're, if you're really imposter syndrome, doubt, who knows? You could actually change someone else's life. How amazing is that? The gift that you can give is incredible. And the last thing I will say is if you're running a business yourself or, or, or have a, a say in a business, my practice now, I don't have side projects. Everything I do is within my, my day. Yep. It's, it's work that I do. It's stuff I produce. Um, if you don't have a business and you're working in a studio and you don't have the time, then yes, do some side projects perhaps. But um, as Garrett said yesterday, get sleep, get exercise. Don't make it take over. If it does take over, that should be your job. And I think pursue it. What about In about, finish on? yeah. <laughs>